and we're going to move to the to the panel session now. So I invite uh, our speakers so far this morning to to join me on the uh, on the panel, if you would. Um, start your videos if you're able to, but certainly at least um, uh, be able to answer the, answer the questions uh, on audio. And uh, in addition to our, our speakers this morning, we have uh, one additional panel member who will be familiar to anyone who's uh, involved in the Open Process Automation Forum. It's great to have uh, Don Bartusiak with us. So Don is the President of Collaboration Systems Integration and Co-Chair of the Open Process Automation Forum. Uh, in October last year, he retired as Chief Engineer for Process Control for ExxonMobil Research and Engineering with 33 years experience. From 1977 to 84, he was a research engineer for Bethlehem Steel, and at Exxon, he implemented real-time artificial intelligence, linear and non-linear model predictive control and real-time optimization applications. From the mid-90s, he held supervisory or senior technical positions responsible for instrumentation, process analyzers, control systems, and control applications. And from 2000 to 2002, he was an adjunct professor at Rice University. Um, you get the picture. Don has a lot of experience here and has been a very active participant in the forum um, and uh, was instrumental in starting it. So welcome to all our panelists. Um, I'm not currently seeing you all on video, but uh, I'm sure you're there. Um, there we are. I recognize Don. Morning, Steve. So nice to see you. So um, thank you all uh, to our speakers for uh, uh, for your inputs this morning. And uh, we've had some uh, some great comments in the chat about uh, how useful the presentations are. I also want to um, we, we've had some some other questions coming in. So I'm going to I'm going to start with with one that was aimed uh, it was originally addressed to Brandon, but I think uh, is certainly something that you may all have something to talk about. Um, and that is a, the, the question that says, uh, can the speaker elaborate on the openness concept from experience and perspective? Obviously, openness is something dear to my heart, but uh, the, the openness angle that uh, that you mentioned, Brandon, if you're if you're there, um, can you expand on that? And uh, and if not, if anyone else would like to expand on the importance of the openness side of this. So I'm not I'm not seeing or hearing Brandon. So um, I do see I do see Don and Anil. Um, but Brandon, you are there, I think, but maybe on mute. Uh, no, thank you. There you go. <laughs> So you were emphasizing the openness uh, aspect, Brandon. And the, the... Uh, you know what? It was great. Yeah, so, I mean, so you, they messed you're up speaking on to that. someone else. The video and audio were out. Of oh, time. maybe, maybe he is. Um, Brandon, you're you're live on the panel. In the in the meantime, I'm going to go to somebody that I know can uh, can say something on this. Um, Don. I know you've uh, yeah. So Steve, spoken on I, this in the past, right? I, I would say the you know the business the business reason for openness is it you know it enables innovation to occur, um, and you know uh, suppliers you know technology providers uh, can access uh, the customers ultimately, you know when there is an, when open architecture prevails. Um, you know, you, Steve, you will remember at the time we kicked off the Open Process Automation Forum, I used the analogy to the Renaissance. I mean, and that's really what I firmly believe, you know, the openness based on industry standards that enables, you know, suppliers to enter the business ecosystem is the way to provide the maximum amount of value to the customers. That is the basic principle. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we 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 heard about uh, you know avoiding tie-in and all all of those uh, all of those points too. So um, let's let's move on to uh, the next question that came in, which is um, let's see, maybe this is uh, one that uh, um, that that Gina, you are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me, Steve? 
I can hear you loud and clear, Jean. Thank you. So um, maybe you can start with this one, or if it if it's not for you, then uh, someone else can step in. But what tools are being used in um, the digital transition to converged IT and OT in industrial engineering? Sure, I can give a few examples from my from my company, and then I encourage uh, the other panelists to to weigh in as well. Um, yeah. For, for for my company, Merck, uh, we have standardized uh, compute platforms. This is really, you know, uh, above level two in the uh, Purdue model. Um, so uh, the use of hyperconvergence, virtualization, um, th these are all technologies we rapidly um, have adopted and deploy. And again, illustrate how IT and OT are converging. Great. Anyone else want to comment on the on the tools that are being used? If not, OK. Um, another question uh, that, that we had in, can can anyone speak to and I know um, Brandon gave a, a gave a, a text a reply to this, but can anyone speak to examples of products that are starting to come to market here um, that the the uh, open standards are helping bring to market? Anyone want to talk about products? I'll, I'll take that one, Steve. Okay. Uh, and Thanks, so I have a unique perspective from you know the and the inside perspective from OPATH. So I hear the the murmurs and I hear you know some ideas being um, you know uh, batted around from end to end. But in terms of uh, product development and commercial offerings for. Pro, uh, for products or systems that are aligned with the OPAS standard, um, you know, I saw, uh, I've, I've seen conversations uh, around our virtual test bed. Um, I've seen uh, uh, comments and and conversation and correspondences around uh, test beds, prototypes, and field trials from a lot of our end users that are that have active partnerships uh, with some of the vendors and suppliers. And more recently, I've seen a, like a coalition of, of members from within the forum banding together to uh, to create and offer a, um, a, 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 a system that is based on, uh, that, that is based or composed of components that are aligned with the OPAST standard. And, you know, a system like that, uh, which is which is soon to be commercially available, will allow um, end users to, you know, they can they can acquire this, this kind of like hands-on tinkering type system that can allow them to, uh, to, to to kind of tinker with and experiment with a a system that has like an open architecture, um, and that'll be kind of like the first a uh, first type of system that's available to the market um, for folks to begin playing with and experiencing a an open kind of architect or system with kind of has an open architecture. Okay. Thank you. In terms of products coming to market, you know, those are three kind of different avenues that uh, that, that that I've seen. That's that's great. And we'll, as as you say, we'll start to uh, we'll see and hear more about that as uh, as these uh, uh, groups of companies working together uh, progress progress what they're doing. So um, thank you for that. Anyone else? Yeah, want and, to come I mean, on it's on it, it's an exciting time, you know, uh, Steve, to see a lot of these markets coming. Or saw a lot of these products coming to market, and um, you know, as folks begin to interoperate and and kind of uh, you know put these put the put a heterogeneous system of components together, it it is uh, it, it is quite a quite exciting. Um, there's a there's a the, the new uh, coalition that that I mentioned is called Copa Quick Start, and then there are other folks that are interoperating uh, uh, components that you know are based on uh, you know very small and inexpensive hardware uh, systems like Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. So it, yes, that is quite exciting. It, it, it is great to it is great to see when uh, when the, the products start coming into the market based on the on the standards. And, and I remember in this case, 
being at an event in the very early days and somebody said oh there will never be products for this um so um it's it's great that great to, to see it happening um next question um and i th think um let's see for uh this question is about uh, digitalization initiatives so for digitalization initiatives that a client usually hires it companies some or many of whom don't have the domain knowledge, for example, in the oil and gas industry. Um, how can this gap be bridged um, and, and how specifically can an automation domain knowledge play a constructive part in this digital transformation? Um, who wants to take that? Is that, uh, is that one that you might wanna tackle Anand initially? If not, I'm open to volunteers. Uh, Steve, this is Gene. Maybe I can address that um, That's timely nice, topic because we are talking to primarily IT companies who come and offer an array of services, want to help with our digital initiatives. Um, many of them do lack the OT or the um, industry specific expertise. And to bridge that divide, I've noticed they've started purchasing system integrators in the space to immediately upskill their folks with domain knowledge so it's something that's very difficult to organically grow uh, grow within your company um and in my opinion it's best acquired but that's just one man's opinion okay yeah Thank yeah you. steve if i if i may comment i, I think just, so gene just highlighted a situation where you know the it service providers are adding to their skill set by acquiring OT systems integrators, the con the converse can happen, which is the you know, the the OT control systems integrators can can build out their IT and computer science and networking skills, and then maybe the the third possibility is one where my company current company is engaged with by partnering with Seaplane Networks, bringing you know IT domain expertise and OT domain expertise together. In, in partnership opportunities. So I would say they're the three things that are happening in the industry to meet that need, that customer need. Great, thanks, thanks for adding that, Don. Um, next question, uh, in the IoT 4.0 based system, how does, uh, how can the SAS system be upgraded specifically in the hydrocarbon industries? There's a specific can anyone tackle that one? So in the IoT 4.0 base system, how does the SIS system be get upgraded um, specifically in a hydrocarbon industry? That may be, may be very, very, uh, maybe too specific here. Well, that, the SIS is the safety instrumented system, Steve. That is the, the safety shutdown system, which uh, by, by industry standard principles is kept separate from controls. So, so I could elaborate on that, but, but I, I think that, that I would say the SIS is a special case that because of its operational criticality and safety criticality requires very uh, careful and methodical planning when upgrades of those systems are, are required. There's an interface between SISs and the control system, but the SIS itself in general is kept separate from the control system. I'll stop there. Right. That's great, but you've given me a nice segue into the next question, Don, which is uh, a, a more general more generally about security. How, how will the security be enhanced? in the um, open standards based systems? There's, um, I think it's compared to what, uh, Steve, is maybe the, right. is one way to think about it. Um, the, the challenge today is that most industrial control systems really rely on obscure, you know, security by obscurity. And um, the systems are, um, are very old, they were never, um, may, you know, they could be 20 or more years old and they were never made to have exposure to the internet to, um, they're not made for easy upgrades or patches. And, um, you know, once bad actors figure out how to exploit that, um, they're extremely vulnerable. Yeah. And, um, uh, 
modern IT systems are fighting that battle every day. And as we've seen, even modern systems, you know, can be vulnerable. So there's no guarantee. Um, but the question is, can you evolve your security posture to meet an evolving threat? And open systems is really the only way to do that. Um, uh, they're just you, a single proprietary, you know, a single vendor of a proprietary system cannot, does not have the resources to, um, to manage that, you know, to 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 uh, update their system constantly to manage every threat. And open systems is just a much broader community and set of tools to do that. So, um, right. it's sort of sort of like um, open systems, uh, you know, may not be inherently secure. They're just a lot more secure than every other option. So right. it's just part of the ongoing battle. Good way of putting it. Yeah, if you try and do it all yourself, you're you're always in catch up mode, aren't you? It's, um... Okay, um, that, that's me. Well, we're running, uh, we're running short on time. But um, is it possible to reprogram the existing manufacturing devices based on open standards? Anyone want to take that one? Can we just reprogram the existing manufacturing devices to meet the standards? I'll, I'll, I'll be very um, blunt here. I mean, we, we've worked with a number of PLC vendors and um, and with a few of, of the DCS vendors. And um, these systems are not made to be um, accessed. Uh, the way that just internally, if you think of a, a particular, like a PLC, um, they're they're not made to be accessed. Now, there's some examples: Phoenix Contact and and um, PLC Open, um, you know, and and PLC Next, I guess, um, you know, have really come a long way. So uh, that's that's there are definitely a, a few systems that are made that way. But far and away, the other systems that we've dealt with, um, there's there's no way to get access to the to the root things that you would need to upgrade. Um, right. So the answer is no. They were never intended that way, were they? So they, uh, they never were. They're, they're very they're very smart, well engineered inside their stack. Mm -hmm. The problem mm -hmm. is that's not sufficient anymore. It's just right. so. If I can. Chime in. Am I allowed to, David Ford Please here from Rockwell, yeah. from Rockwell Automation? I, my answer to that question would be some yes, some no. Right? That uh, you know, there's certainly PLCs which have the resources needed to perform this kind of thing, and there are other PLCs that that are old enough or you know cheap enough that they just don't have the resources they need. Uh, but we fully anticipate that some will be reprogrammable and others won't. Right. Okay, we're going to move to uh, what I'm afraid is going to have to be the last question given time. There are one or two more in the uh, in the Q and A that, uh, if any of our panelists could could get to answer, that would be uh, appreciated. I'm sure by the askers. Um, this one is uh, 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 this one's uh, an interesting one. I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about. Could the panelists elaborate on how different end users have started on their journey towards the migration to open systems? And uh, are there any starter kits available? So, uh, any examples of how um, how different end users have have um, started started their journey towards migrating to open systems? Anyone want to take that? Yeah, I, the, the best way is to be involved in the forum and to yeah. be involved in the standard, and um, because that is the entire ecosystem of everyone that's innovating. And, and I would say that. You know, every company that's involved is, you know, contributing to that, creating that on ramp, uh, you know, to, to make that migration and to, to begin that journey. Um, because it's in the standards body, it, it's, uh, I would just say that there's a group of, um, of members of OPATH that are, uh, have come together and made an offering. And Don Bartusiak and my, myself are, uh, very involved in that, and if you want to look it up, it's copacontrol.org, C-O-P-A, control.org. Um, but I, I'm not trying to make a plug for that, but but we've given a lot of thought to how do people get started from a technical standpoint. But the most important thing is to become involved in the forum. Yeah, yeah Steve, I would, in, a, in addition to the COPA quick start activity that Brandon just cited, uh, a, a half a dozen of the operating companies in the OPA forum have shared information publicly about their steps uh, to build uh, 
OPAS aligned systems, and that would include ExxonMobil, BASF, uh, Georgia Pacific affiliate of Coke Industries, uh, Saudi Aramco, Petronas, and Reliance Industries. So those half a dozen companies have been uh, uh, bringing information to the public domain about what they're doing, in addition right. to Copa Quick Start. Thanks for that, Don. Yeah. Any last uh, comment from anyone else on the panel on that uh, on that topic? And if not, we'll call it a day for for this panel. Thank you, uh, all the panelists and and uh, speakers today so far. Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break now, 15 minutes, um, and then we'll be uh, back with some more presentations. And after that, another panel session. Meanwhile, a warm thank you from the open group for uh, for your contributions this morning, gentlemen. Thank you.